Hello everybody, welcome to this month's edition of My Life on the Hill. We're going to do a few interesting features this month in keeping with the weather, the fact that there's a little bit of snow on the ground. We're going to look at the chickens, uh, get a little bit of chicken info, because that's always quite fun. Uh, I'm going to teach you, well no, when I say teach, I'm going to show you how I've started to make some willow baskets. Uh, some nice little interesting story behind that. And in keeping with the fact that there is a nice little white covering on the ground, we're going to look at some animal tracks and the kind of stories that, that the movement, the passage of animals depict during the course of a, of a night. So without further ado, let's go and have a look. One of the beauties with snow, of course, is that you can tell what kind of animals are on your doorstep. It's really quite nice first thing in the morning, you know, when we do our little circuit, Lily and I, Lily in her little backpack and my little terrier George alongside of me, to see all the footprints, fresh footprints, you know, they're kind of untainted by human footprints because no one's been around that early, generally speaking. So anyway, when we're walking up the green lane inside the house this morning, I clocked some badger's footprints. And remarkably, I followed those badger footprints right the way round the whole hill, right the way back to this south-facing slope. And as you were looking at me now, well, literally, the River Wye winds down behind me, down under Kapler Hill. And, uh, and Ballingham is on the other side of the bank. So this is a lovely kind of south-facing slope. And the temperature changed in the middle of the night last night. It suddenly became warmer and it started to rain. You know, this big warm front coming in. So the badger probably thought, oh, you know, it's, oh, I, can, I can sort of muster the, the energy to come out of my set and go and wander around, see if I can find some morsels. So it's scattered around and it's found just down below my feet here at some, some tusky grass and it's scratched some of the grass. And of course, what they'll do is they'll, they'll come out and they'll forage around for grubs leather jacket grubs or, uh, or worms, things like that. I mean, they adore worms, you know. So, so a, a lot of the time, even when it's really cold, a lot of earthworms will be sat just under the surface. So in this bit of thawed ground, the badger will be rummaging around, but also they collect lots of leaf litter and grasses and whatnot to take back to their, uh, their sets. They're very clean animals, badgers, you know. I mean, I always remember as a kid, my Uncle Jim talking to me about badgers and foxes, the difference between a badger and a fox. Foxes are very dirty, you know, they're, they're not the same as, uh, as badgers in the sense that they don't really clean out their, their sets so much. They're much lazier, you know, they're not, they're not working as well. And often, badgers and foxes will share the same underground dwelling because a, a badger is kind of looking after the fox's his den for it's cleaning out its den for it you know it's it's looking up it's like home keeper really in some respect but um so they are wonderfully wonderfully clean animals very intelligent and it, it's great to see their footprints it's great to see a badger's footprint padding around in the snow it's good to see they're here the snow is disappearing now which i'm thrilled about because you know uh, if you if you live in the country uh, snow has a very limited appeal it's not say it just it causes a great deal of problems really, you know, getting to the house, uh, having to feed animals more food and so on and so forth. So um, this is the best form of snow, the snow that comes and goes almost immediately. And as I look here, I can see lots of these fabulous little worm casts, you know, which is a, a real sort of indication that the worm life is just under the surface, so within range of a, the sharp, big, heavy claws of a badger. And here you go, here's, a, here's a, an example of what I'm talking about. This is a, a lovely little red worm. So of course if I was a badger I'd slurp that down. That would be a, a very tasty treat for me. That's a species called Lumbricus rebellus. And it's a fabulous, I mean it's making a fabulous little composting worm actually. Uh, again they're a kind of leaf litter worm. But that's a species of worm that doesn't like to stay in the same place for very long. That is a, that's the gypsy of the worm world. And I think it's probably quite lucky that it's still intact underneath that little pile of leaves because you know, the badgers obviously, obviously missed that, but I'm kind of assuming that it, it's eaten a bunch of its chums. Rabbit footprints are probably the most distinct set of footprints you'll ever see out of any animal. You know, the, you, you've got the two back feet, which are just kind of separated at the back of a set of four. The two front feet are always 
pretty much parallel to one another at the front of those uh, the set of four. So uh, so dead easy tracks to, to distinguish from anything else. And the whole of the side of the hill is littered with, with bunny footprints. And it's amazing to see because it, you know, it just gives you an idea because in the daytime you can wander about, you'll see the odd rabbit, you know, at night you'll wander, see the odd rabbit. But when you kind of see the amount of footprints that are up here, you get an idea of the quantity of animals that are around. And look, even some blackbird tracks. I'd just like to show you a few bits and bobs with the chickens because it just seems like a nice day to do that. Then there is no wind, in fact there's not a breath of wind. And the, the hens are always so much calmer when it's like this, so we'll go down and check those little girls out and see what they're up to. Because at this time of year, the bird's plumage is fantastic as well, you know, they finish molting. It's remarkable that chickens can molt, they, they can molt in the middle of winter, and they're almost naked, and yet they can still stick the, the rigours of the freezing, bitterly cold temperatures that kind of howl up the valley here, they, they seem unfazed by it. But her plumage now is beautiful, I and mean, when they molt, they don't lay. So she's really sort of coming to her own now. As the daylight hours pick up after Christmas, they really start to lay a lot more. You have this sort of tract of time almost from sort of October through to Christmas where you're lucky to get any eggs whatsoever. But now we're sort of getting four or five eggs a day from our, our flock of uh, nine hens now, I think. Um, some of which are a bit old, so I mean, really, they're not laying that much at all anyway. But this bird, another way you can tell that she's laying is her comb is beautifully red. You know, they're, 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 they're really kind of crimson red combs when they start to lay. Um, if they're pale in the comb, then it could be for a variety of reasons. But sometimes, they're in, especially in the summer, if the hen house is inundated with mites, a real indication is that the bird's combs are very pale because, of course, the mites will concentrate on their combs, you know, and they'll be sort of sucking the blood from that, that area. And uh, the chicken always looks sort of poorly. So, I mean, mites, for me, are probably one of the worst things I have to deal with. I mean, chickens are robust, you know, they're very hardy. I mean, having said that, they often pick up ailments you don't know what it is one day they're looking poorly the next day they're dead but generally speaking they're they're perfectly fine for years and years and years they live for more than 10 years a chicken will so that in mind should we see if there's uh, any eggs in the hen house have a look all right let's see if there's an egg here oh there's a beautiful chunky egg there and there's we haven't this isn't a setup you know that egg has been laid fresh this morning. So I don't know whether you want to have a quick squiz at that. It is a picture of, of beauty. And, and it's, it's an amazing thing. My wife Sarah still gets excited every time I come in the house with eggs. She'll say, how many eggs have we got today? And we keep chickens for years and years now. I'll say all oh, four. And she'll, oh, oh. You know, it's a, it's a great thing to have. It's a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful resource in many respects. And they taste so beautiful. You know, every morning we'll crack an egg and we'll just will just wonder at the colour of those eggs. Chickens are kept on grass, plenty of grass. The eggs are vivid orange. They're almost metallic orange when you when you crack them open. The yolks, gorgeous. So looking down, the, the snow is disappearing now, but to, uh, to add to our little collective of footprints, there are lots of hen footprints down here. And everything is remarkable that the feet look so much larger when they're in the snow than they do on the end of the bird. If I'm scratching for things to do at home and, uh, and there's snow on the ground, it's very difficult to find stuff that you can really do, get stuck into. So there's always like little, little backup jobs. And uh, the farmer where I cut my willow stopped me the other day because I was coming out the gate and he said, oh, could you make me a willow basket? I said, yeah, I can, uh, I can, I can give that a go. I've never made a willow basket before my life. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, that'd be great. He said, can you make it about three foot by a foot and a half? Uh, I said, yeah, okay, uh, just you know, just kind of agreeing with whatever he'd asked me to do. I said, that'd be a pleasure. So anyway, I, I, as I was driving home, I thought, what have I committed to now? Uh, but uh, over the last couple of weeks, with my little lily strapped to my back, we made this willow basket. 
it's an enjoyable thing to do and it's so simple that's the best of it. i think about anybody can do it you know if i can do it then anybody could do it so i've uh, i've used my little work mate bought this out from the shed and all i did to make the base we won't we won't make this whole thing today but just to give you an idea of, of uh, how to make the base very similar to making hurdles really in many respects just on a, on a slightly smaller scale so I took a little plank of wood and I've drilled holes in the wood uh, it, it, at equal distances right the way along its length the piece of wood that I've drilled the holes in is bigger than the base that I'm going to make today uh, probably twice the size of the uh, of the base that I'm going to make today. I did take some measurements the other day, and I think I'm kind of looking at about sort of 50 centimeter square almost the baskets that I uh, that I need to make. So anyway, I shall uh, I get started. Um, I've got some uh, some bundles of withies here that I cut. Now the beauty of these withies as well though is that they are they're all different colours. Now when you when you buy uh, with these that are brown that have been debarked, then they're all exactly the same colour. They tend to be dry and whatnot. But when you use uh, fresh green ones, they, they, the bark is obviously a different different colour. They will, in time, all become much of a muchness. Uh, but when you first present that with, to somebody, you know the fact that you've got yellows and greens and sort of light browns and things like that in there. You know, it's uh, it's it's quite a thrill, really. So all I do is take my little knife. Let's take uh, some of these. Uh, these longer rods, and I'll sharpen up the ends. And uh, I'll quite literally stick a rod into these holes here. And really, I only need to put them into those holes sufficient to hold them upright. I don't really want to stick them in there, jam them in there, because obviously I've got to get that plank off those rods afterwards. So I'll just take the tape. I'm going to measure the uh, the length of the of the base that I'm going to make. Uh, now, obviously, the, the uprights on the outer edges will determine the uh, the exact width of the the basket. So I'm just measuring roughly. It doesn't have to be exact for sure, really. But um, and I can see from that that I need to add another rod. So I'll put another rod there to give me my width. I'm just going to use some very thin little withies to start off because I'm going to sort of overlap them. Um, after the after the initial sort of overlap, i.e., when you've you've got your proper spacing between the uprights, then I can simply weave slightly thicker rods between the the, uh, the uprights. But I'll just show you what I mean between sort of overlapping these little fine withies. So I'm quite simply getting them like this, and then threading them through. Like so. Okay, so you get you get an idea of what I've done here. So I'm quite literally sort of overlapping them, really, and then that gives it some sort of integrity to begin the process. And uh, I can do that two or three times. Also, I'll bring this the end piece in and around again to give that outside rod. Some rigidity. I mean, I've got no sort of inclination to be a professional bars. It's not necessarily something I'd want to spend my life doing, but it's just another, it's a nice little skill to have. And, uh, and of course, after I made that basket the other day, as my Sarah said, Oh, we could, you could do some of those for us. <laughs> and, it, and it would make a fantastic, you know, Christmas present for somebody to give them a, a little wood basket or a little basket that they could put a plant pot in or something like that because there's a little bit of, you know, there's a bit of passion that's gone into it. And it, and it, you know, it really does look the part. I mean, willow weaving is a is a lovely thing to be able to do, really. And it and it is so so simple. I think what uh, if I was a professional willow weaving basket maker, I'd probably trim off some of these little ends before I weave them in because they're all of a slightly different diameter. But I don't really want to because I quite like the idea of the different thicknesses. You know, if you look at a conventional basket that you buy, many of which, especially the cheap willow baskets that you can get in a B&Q and stuff like that, they're not made in this country. You know, they're, 
they're made in uh, Eastern Europe. They're, they're, uh, they tend to be made um, with materials that's all sort of exactly the same diameter, and uh, and, and you know invariably very quickly uh, by with using kind of inexpensive labour. Uh, so you know it's uh, it's nice to have that the distinction between something that's that's you know has s- s- slight imperfections, uh, but in many respects takes slightly longer to do. Um, but makes better use of, uh, of materials than it is to, you know, have something that's kind of off the shelf and and looks perfect. But but uh, I think in some respects it's the imperfections about uh, you know the, the, this naturally made uh, product that uh, that gives it its charm. I'm not going to make you watch a whole episode of me making this basket. Really, this is something that I can I can dip into occasionally. I mean, my, my sort of circumstances now, my little daughter and stuff like that have uh, determined that I, I tend to grab the opportunity to do assorted things when I've got the chance. So if it's mild and I've got a lily day, then what I might do is pop her on my back and come down here and finish this willow basket. So chances are, in the next episode, after I've made the base, we can... I can stick the sides on and give you an idea of how, of how to make the sides as well uh, and give you an idea of what the base looks like, really. Well, that's it from me. That's it for this episode of My Life on the Hill. So I look forward to seeing you guys next month. See you next time. Mm-hmm.